Give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. John chapter 1, verse number 14. While you're turning there, I just want to say I give honor to the Mangans and uh, all the officials that are here tonight. A lot of friends. It's good to have my wife and family here tonight. I got almost all of them here. But uh, outside of the Holy Ghost, the best gift God ever gave me. Amen. And I'm honored to have them. And uh, my brother's here. It's just a lot of friends. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 1, verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. And we beheld His glory. And we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Everybody said amen. amen. I want to talk to you tonight about fig leaves and veils. Fig leaves and veils. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. You may be seated. God bless you. I just want to start by saying it's all about the glory. It really is. Last year at Because of the Times, they asked to serve on a panel, and it has been since that panel something sparked. And I have been on a little journey in trying to understand a little bit about the kingdom, some of the statements of Jesus. The Lord's Prayer has become probably more important to me in the last few months than ever. Matter of fact, I feel like we will learn the power of His prayer before we get out of here. Especially keep us from evil. But I, uh, I begin to look at some of these things and I think the Lord for his ability and his willingness to show us things. Some of us aren't near as smart as we think we are. It's just the goodness of God, the grace of God. It's by revelation. I, uh, I thank him for it. And I, I've, you know, it's like anything else that God begins to deal with me about. It comes in pieces. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And it's line upon line, here a little and there a little. But I begin very strongly to look at the kingdom and what the kingdom would really look like if it really appeared. I think we have a good understanding of the church and its culture, but the kingdom is a different story. I believe that God wants his kingdom to come in this earth. It's going to come. We know there'll be a kingdom age. But I thank the Lord tonight for the fact that in the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Not on earth, but in earth. And then he concludes it with, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. I believe that wherever you find the kingdom, you will find his power and his glory. I do. I want you to just take a little journey with me here tonight. In the book of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul begins to write about Moses coming from the mountain. A lot of times we have put into that the reason that the veil was placed upon Moses' face is because that radiant glory it was too radiant to look at. But the fact is, is that Paul alludes and lets us to know that the glory was really fading off of the face of Moses. 
and that God did not want the people to associate the fading glory with the law. If they seen the glory fade, they would think that once it was diminished, that the law would no longer have any power or effect. And so, God gave them a veil. They created a veil, put it over the face of Moses. The great apostle Paul was wanting us to understand and said that that veil is still there. He really alluded to the fact that the veil was now unbelief. Because of unbelief, they could not see the glory that was not in the face of Moses, but was in the face of Jesus Christ. He said the glory of that old, the old glory was fading, but this glory was never going to fade. What a lot of people do not understand is, as Paul continues into that particular subject, he doesn't change subjects, it goes into the fourth chapter, when he starts talking about, we didn't come to you with cunning craftiness. One translation says, we didn't come to you like the serpent came to Eve. We preached to you the unadulterated word of God. We told you what the gospel was. We didn't try to veil it from you. We didn't try to hide it from you. One translation says, we did not dilute it with water and wine. We preached to you exactly as it is. He goes on to explain what he believed. And in that, he talks about that to whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believed not. Now, I want you to understand when he comes to that, uh, he's using the same word when he talks about blinded. He's using the same word that he uses in the previous chapter about veil. In other words, when the gospel was preached to you and you chose not to, to believe it. It become veiled to you. It become hid from you. I can't believe that God would hide anything from people that didn't have a choice or a chance at least to believe. Oh, it's quiet right now. Amen. I, I want to say something here, and I want you to let me finish before you judge it too harshly. Uh, here a few weeks ago, I just kind of talking to the Lord and just the way I do and he he brought me back to these passages of scripture and this is what he said do you really think that I left the evangelization of the world strictly in your hands I knew that's what you'd do do you think I take that kind of a chance boy it is quiet in here right now I, well, Lord, I, I don't quite understand what you're trying to say. John chapter 1 says this is the true light. And he said this true light lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I personally believe with every human being born, at some moment in their life, the light comes on. They're not handed a track. They're not taught a Bible study. But the light comes on. Now they have a choice to make. Either by faith they begin the journey to accept it, or they reject the truth or the revelation. He tells us what it is. The glorious gospel is the glory that shines in the face of Jesus Christ. It is the will of God for the revelation of Jesus Christ to come to the entire world. Now, whether or not they accept it or reject it, that's in their portfolio. But I want you to know, well, somebody says, well, what's that got to do with us? Well, and how, how do we play into it? Well, Paul's giving you his testimony is what he's giving you when he says, uh, you know, I, I, I know what this is about. I was on my way with the letters in my pocket. What in the world do you think happened to me? I sure wasn't headed to a Christian church service to be saved. But that light appeared to me. And I looked into that blinding light and I asked the question, Who art thou, Lord? And of course the revelation came. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now you're saying, well, what do we do? Well, this is where you come in. 
if we would learn to allow the Holy Ghost to direct us to people that the light is coming on in their spirits, we're not excused from evangelism. We're not excused from reaching people. But the fact is, no man cometh to the Father, save the Spirit, draw him. Uh, I had somebody ask me here a while back a hypothetical question. Most hypothetical questions are ridiculous. Amen. So would you really believe that if somebody on their deathbed that's repented and maybe got baptized, hadn't received the Holy Ghost, dies, so they're not safe? I said, that's the dumbest question anybody's ever asked me. Why would God get you in the process of drawing you, get you halfway in the journey, and then pull the plug on you? I said, it don't work quite that way. That's how come we need to leave here with rejoicing in our heart that in the end time there will be one name, one God. There's about to be a revelation of Jesus Christ spread through this world like we have never seen before. <laughs> Folks, there shall be light in the evening time. Somebody said amen. amen. Now, I, I, I want to I show you. He said that when Moses come down, the glory's fading, and so the veil's put over his face. So it stands to reason, and I want you to hear me, it stands to reason that any time there is a fading glory, whether it's in an organization, a church, a ministry, or an individual, any time there is a fading glory, we have to start creating veils to hide the fact that the glory is not as radiant as it was yesterday or the day before or a few weeks before. Oh, boy. Veils, veils. Any time the glory of God is diminishing or any time that we see something fade, we start creating these things to hide it, to, to, to create something to distract the eye from the fact that something is not there that needs to be there. Praise God. Now, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but personally, I lean toward the fact that when the Scripture says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For you have crowned him with glory and with honor. It means to envelop. It was the glory and the honor of God that enveloped humanity. I believe in the garden. It was the glory of God that clothed Adam and Eve. But I want you to watch the process. Adam, the day that you eat the fruit of that tree, you're going to die. You know, Adam did not die in the physical sense when his disobedience, but I believe he did die spiritually. And the next thing you know, they, uh, they got some fig leaves, and they're trying to cover their nakedness. They're hiding from God, and God comes in the cool of the day, uh, one translation that I read, I like, said, God told Adam, Adam, I'm in our meeting place. Where are you? Well, uh, we're naked, and uh, we've created some aprons. Uh, Adam, how do you know that you're naked? Well, our disobedience has caused us to lose the glory. And because we have no glory, we've created some fig leaves. And we're trying to cover our nakedness. We don't want people to see our, our nakedness. And so God said, no, this is not what I intended. I want you to know that our disobedience, our disobedience, us getting out of alignment with the word of God starts creating something that affects the glory of God. Praise God. Amen. Any time in our disobedience, we begin to lose the glory. We start creating fig leaves and aprons or veils to cover up the fact that we're naked now and there's no glory. And it's a fading glory at best. But I've come tonight to challenge you. It is not the intent nor the will of God for this church to create veils or fig leaves. It is the intent of God for this end time church to go out of here in the glory of God and in the majesty of God. Praise God. Praise God. 
Now, I don't know altogether how to explain this to you. I, I really don't. I, I just know how it comes to me, and hopefully it'll make a little sense here tonight. Amen. But uh, I, I, I get a little alarmed sometimes because uh, when, when the glory starts fading, some of the things that we start creating, uh, in, in, I don't know how to get into this without probably making some folks mad. <laughs> but uh, Paul, when he got to Athens, Mars Hill, uh, to the God of this, this unknown God, he makes this statement. He says, um, I want to declare him to you. And he starts in this discourse, which is a tremendous discourse. And in it, he says, uh, this God, this unknown God, in him, in him. He said, first of all, we are his offspring. But in him, we live, we move, and we have our being. This is where our life comes from. This is not just some inscription. This is not some dead God. He's alive, and in him we have our life. And But now, if your God's not dead, he said, then you better start with some vain imagination. You better start creating some things. Uh, so you better make sure that you create something that has gold and silver because uh, you're going to need something to attract the eye from the absence of glory and spiritual life. You better make sure you get it blinged out enough that they can't tell the fact that there's no life here. There is, I feel like preaching right now, there is no glory here. So uh, gold and silver, uh, just, just put it on and, and create it. Make your idols, get everything created. Uh, you want to attract the eye to the fact that uh, it's, it's not here. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, my God. I can't believe you'd say it, but just chill. Just chill. Now, here's the deal. I know when you start talking about bling and gold and silver, people want to take your Brother Cox over to the Old Testament. And they want to point out to the fact in the Old Testament that God adorned Israel with all this, I call it bling. And, uh, well, see... Well, first of all, they had no monetary systems then. They didn't have currency. And so for a man to show his glory, because that's what glory means. It deals with, with the weight of something. It deals with wealth. It deals with splendor. So for God to show his wealth, or a man to show his wealth or his splendor, he would put it on his wife. I want you to see my glory. Here it is. I want you to see my wealth. I'm going to put it on her. Ooh. Mm. I want you to see how wealthy I really am. I want you to see my riches. So I'm going to put it on her. God have mercy. And so he tells Israel in the book of Ezekiel, I adorned you. I decked you out. But he said, but you didn't understand. It was really not about your beauty. It was about my comeliness. I put that on you so that people could see my glory or my wealth. But you have turned it around and you have used it to attract your lovers. Oh, you've taken the gold and the silver. Now, I, I don't know how far to get into this, but... I got this reading some of this the other day and got over in the book of Proverbs, believe it or not. I found two women in the book of Proverbs. That proverb, the writer Solomon mentions in the book of Proverbs. The first woman he talks about is wisdom. The second woman he talks about is the strange woman or a harlot. You ought to go read what he says about the bride or about wisdom. He said, in concern to wisdom, he said, you'll find her in the gates. He said, her wealth is greater than rubies and silver and gold. And then he gives description to the harlot. And he said, the harlot is decked, and he talks about all this stuff. And she stands, basically is what he's saying, she stands on the street corner and beckons come. But he said, let me tell you something. Her way is a path 
to death. And oh, by the way, she'll never quit changing. She'll lead you on a path that is constantly forever changing. It'll be this one day, this the next day, this the day after. Nothing ever changes because she don't even know where she's going. It's the path to death. So I was reading that. The Lord said, well, there's still two women. I called the church the manifold wisdom of God. So when God said, I want to show you my wisdom, I want to show you my glory, I want to show you my wealth, he created something called the church, and he adorned her, and he decked her out with his glory. <laughs> now, I... I don't want to offend anybody here tonight, but, uh, you know, the book of Revelation starts talking about the bride and the harlot and talks about the description of those things, and he said, the bride is in fine linen. Mm. She stands in her own beauty and her own purity, and Jesus said, that the pure in heart shall see God. Now, you don't go to a prostitute out of purity. And you don't go to a prostitute for long-term commitment. And so she adorns herself only to attract the eye, to satisfy the sensual side of your humanity to allure you by her glory. Come this way with me. But remember, her path is to death. And there's never an, a, not a stopping of changing in her. And so we have to decide how we want our congregations to be adorned. We do. We either allow the glory of God to adorn us and when it adorns, it attracts the pure of heart. It attracts those that say, I want to find Jesus. I want to serve him. I want him to be my Lord. Now, if you put enough bling on your church, and if you do enough stuff to attract that sort of people coming, let me tell you something. They're not coming out of a commitment. They're only coming because you have appealed to the eye. You've appealed to the sensual side. And I will also tell you, the next old girl down the road that dresses up a little better and looks a little better, they're going to leave you and go right down the road to her. So you might as well decide tonight, I want the glory of God to envelop my ministry. I want the glory of God to envelop my congregation. I don't need any veils. I don't need any fig leaves. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now, huh. Dress her up. Put all the bling on her you can put. Attract whoever you can attract. But her ways and her path is to death. There's no real spirit life there. God, help us tonight. Help us. You know, I just, I'm kind of old school. I really am. I, I like all this stuff. I really do. I like it. Man, we was having some crusades, and I got, I mean, I got crucified for having moving lights. Son, they come out with the swords. <laughs> yeah, the lights moving. Mm-hmm. And here's what happened. We're in the altar call. And in the Cow Palace here in San Francisco, one of the, the stagehands hit the fog machine button by mistake.
And so I'm in the middle of giving an altar call. And it's, I said, man, I never knew the glory come from down there. Oh, you should have heard them. You had moving lights. You had smoke. And it ain't holy. And it ain't holy. I said, well, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. So I, I want you to understand, we had lights when lights weren't cool. But I'll just give you a little insight. Nothing. Th these are great accessories. But nothing can put on a light show like the glory. Nothing. Nothing can attract their attention like the glory. Whoa. I remember as a boy in uh, one year at the Missouri Youth Camp or one of me, old Westphalia, God have mercy. And <laughs> we was down there worshiping, and all of a sudden at the end of it, this 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 blue mist and haze come in and settled above the heads of the people. Whoo. It was the glory of God. Those kids wasn't moving. I mean, they were worshiping and this glory had descended. Now, please, just, just let me say it. You not get all mad. I walked in to preach a youth function here a while back and went and stood back next to the sound guy. He wasn't one of us. And I was just standing back there. And the kids were up there and they were doing their thing. And, and he's back there kind of bouncing around a little bit. He looked over and said, hey. He come over and say, hey, next time y'all want to do this, just tell me you want the club scene. I know what you need. I said, what? He said, this is a club scene. Now, I'm not, I'm not an old man on a soapbox here tonight, but that kind of bothered me. But the world would assume that it was the same scene that they perform in the clubs. Where in the name of God is the glory of the Lord? That, oh, it locked up right there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not after anything here tonight. But I'm going to tell you something. You just remember something. When the glory begins to fade, you better do something. You better create something. But brother, if the glory is in the face of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to tell you why I'm preaching so strong about it. Because if you listen to what Paul says, I want you to hear me. If you, boy, I feel a little help right now. Paul said it's by this glory that we are changed into his image. From glory to glory by the Spirit. See, when you veil the glory, people can't see what they're supposed to become. know what they're supposed to become they have no idea what they're supposed to become and I know I understand all of us has a purpose but let me tell you what God said his purpose was it was quoted today all things work together for the good but read on down there according to his purpose I understand you got a purpose but God's got a purpose and he told you what the purpose was in the next verse that we might be conformed into the image of of his dear son but if you put a veil over the face of Jesus Christ and people can't see what he really looks like how in the world are they supposed to change when you take the glory out you take the changing agent out you let the glory in the face of Jesus Christ shine trust me when they see it the Holy Ghost says my job is to get you all right, okay. You know, how many of you got GPS? You get in your car, you push GPS, it always starts the same, current location. Because you can't start somewhere you're not. Does anybody know what the next thing it says is? Destination. Can 
kind of person would I be to put in there? Don't know. <laughs> Just pick something for me. We're on a journey. <laughs> Just take me on whatever journey you want to take me on. Let me tell you something. He told you in the book of Romans, in the arena of sonship, he told you. He said, let me tell you something. He said, I've already predestined your journey. Predestination is that you would be conformed into the image of his son. Predestination is not about individual predestination. It's about sonship. And he said, the journey is to get you to look like me, act like me, talk like me, and have the glory that I have. And when you start to change it or to cover it up, you're missing exactly what this is all about. It's not about what the UPC teaches or preaches. It's about the revelation of Jesus Christ and us standing in his presence. Wow. Now what brings the glory? I got to hurry. What brings the glory? What brings the glory? <laughs> Man, this is where it gets weird. It really gets weird. So after because times last year, went back, started looking at this. And I found over in the book of Genesis, Moses comes down to attending off this mountain. He reads the law to the people three times. And they said, we will obey. We will hearken. We will obey. And the next thing you know, the heavens open. And Moses and the 70 elders seen the glory of of God. Right. Seen the glory of God. They seen into the heavens. They seen the sapphire floor that separated the heavenly from the earthly. And they seen it. They seen the glory, the throne of God. And it only happened because people said, We will obey. We will obey. Oh boy, help me, Jesus. We will obey. Well, that's not the only time they've seen it. If you read over, now this is where it gets really interesting. The book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel is about the glory. And so God snatches him up. First of all, he said, I'm going to show you something. And I'm going to tell you. The first thing he sees is these wheels in the middle of the wheel. Now you start explaining some of the stuff to people that know anything about this. They would swear you're high. I mean, people in San Francisco pay good money to have these kind of experiences. I mean, these wheels in the middle of the wheel, you got a wheel going north and south, you got another wheel going east and west. You got that? If I'd have been sharp, I'd have had a picture drawn up there for everybody. And, and, and then above it, you got these angels, cherubims, and they got four faces. Now you're dealing with people that's got two. Four faces. My God. Four, Brother Cox. But the deal is, the scripture says that this thing was never to turn. See your car, its wheels go in one direction, and for you to change direction, you got to turn it. But you never had to turn this thing, because if you wanted to go north, it would go north, south, south, east, west, whatever way. And then these faces, the face of the man, lion, ox, whatever you go, each face of the man faced in one direction, and the face of the, they faced another. So whichever way this thing moved, that face represented how God would represent himself. But it never turned. And Ezekiel's watching this thing. And he watches it and it goes into the holy of holies. And it pauses there. And it waits. And Ezekiel is patiently waiting to see. And the next thing you know, 
the glory comes off the mercy seat and moves over on top of this thing. This thing that Ezekiel was saying was God's transit system for the glory. And it waits there a little bit. And I believe the reason why it was waiting is God's asking Israel, if you repent, this is as far as it will go. See, when you open the other night with repentance, they didn't know repentance was what was contingent for the glory to come. And then it moves outside, and it goes, there's four places, save you a lot of time, it visits. And every place it visits, it pauses and waits. If you'll just repent, if you'll just repent, it'll stop here, and I'll go back to the mercy seat. But it's God's gradual goodbye. And it goes to the Mount of Olivet. And Ezekiel watches it as it ascends into the heavens. Isn't it amazing the last week of Jesus Christ on the earth, he visited all four places. Ezekiel was seeing Jesus Christ as he went to the mercy seat and said, and that's exactly what John meant when he said, and we beheld the glory. Because the glory was always in the third dimension. The glory was never in the holy place, which is our emotions. It was never at the altar, which is in our flesh. It was always in the holy of holies. There is only one kind of light in the holy of holies. And that is the Shekinah and the glory of God. That's it. That's it. But I find it also amazing that when Jesus Christ comes back to this old earth, the first place he's going to put his foot is the Mount of Olivet. And he's declaring to everybody, the glory has left, but it's not finished. The glory's coming back. And Ezekiel's seen another temple. Are you listening to me? And you watch these things. You say, wow. And then he watches it as it goes from the Mount of Olivet, and it gets into the heavens. This is where it kind of gets crazy. And then the next thing you know, Boy, God's going to do something. God is going to do something. You see, it go past as it ascends into the heavens. It goes past that sapphire floor. And it goes to the throne. And the glory of God and these beings and these cherubims, the Bible says, they begin to fly. They cover their face. They cover their feet. Holy, holy, holy. Ezekiel's not the only one that's seen it. Isaiah's seen it in the, in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. See, Ezekiel and Isaiah were seen into the heavens. They were seen the throne of God in the heavens. Jesus said, let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. I've struggled to understand the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is exactly that. Last year we talked about the fact that every congregation has to decide what throne is going to rule it. You will either have a throne of iniquity that rules in your congregation or you'll have a throne of righteousness. You've got to decide. But wherever the throne of God's righteousness is, that means in heaven it rules. But these men seen something happen on the earth. They're watching it transpire. Now, that's not the only person that sees it in the Old Testament. Jacob has the same vision, believe it or not. It's a little different, but he sees this ladder come down from heaven. And he sees angels ascending and descending upon it. And the next day he says, hey, this is none other but the house of God and the gate of heaven. And I knew it not. I didn't know he dwelt here. I thought it was just a story from my grandpa. But God dwells here. This place of the altar and sacrifice, God dwells here. This is none other but the house of God, the gate of heaven. And then you go to the, Old Test the New Testament, and Jesus calls for Nathaniel. And he gets over there and says, man, I see you in the fig tree. He said, yeah, that's a pretty cool trick. Man, that's pretty cool. You must be a prophet or something. He said, oh, Nathaniel. He said, just get ready. From this day forward, the heavens are going to open. And you will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, what a lot of you don't understand is Jesus just declared right there, you are present tense looking at the house of God and the gate of heaven. 
I now am the kingdom of God on the earth. I am in alignment. I am, have I lost you? I am in alignment. I can represent the kingdom of God. You're looking at the house of God. Now you go to the temptation, second temptation. He's there, and Lucifer says, come on with me. We'll take you to a high mountain. And he calls us all the kingdoms of the earth to pass by in a moment's time, and their glory. And he says to Jesus, if you will bow and worship me, uh, I'll give you this glory, and I'll give you these kingdoms. And Jesus said, you've got to be kidding me. What? Now you may have got the first Adam. He may have took the bait. He may have swapped you the glory. But not this Adam. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now see, some of you, some of you will get the identity. It is the great revelation of the end time. It is the revelation of sonship. We understand the mighty God in Christ. We understand the mighty God in us. But the second temptation, see, the first temptation is exactly that. If thou be the son of God, turn these stones to bread. He's trying to work through his humanity. But the second temptation is this. I want you to make me your king and I will give you glory. Let's swap glory. You give me the glory of God and the eternal glory, and I'll give you the glory of kingdoms of dirt. So, a lot of us, we start getting a revelation of who we are. But the second or the temptation, but the second temptation is this. Uh, let's exchange glories. I'll give you the glory of all of this. If you'll just worship me, make me your king. I want the throne of iniquity to rule in your life. Jesus said, absolutely not. I can only do what my father tells me to do. I can only say what he tells me to say. Do you think I'm going to come out of alignment with him and trade you the glory of that kingdom for the kingdom of dirt? You've got to be kidding me. But you'll be surprised how many of us, we exchange the glory. He parades it in front of us. And we say, oh, that looks nice. I'd kind of like to have that. Be careful, my friend. It's just veils and fig leaves. It's not really what it's all about. And once you get it, you'll wear it. I'm telling you, it's not time for this end time church to decide we don't need the glory of God. The only way that we will ever impact our world is by the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's remove the veils. Let's remove the fig leaves. And let's let the glory of God manifest. Just go from there to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I won't do it for you. It's there. It's all about the exchange of glory. Let's just swap glories. Let's get rid of the glory. Take this glory. Create some veils. Mm. Create some veils. What brings the glory, Brother Gleason, the kingdom? It's when I submit to his kingdom in heaven. And I get an alignment. And God says, now that we're in alignment, you now represent my kingdom on the earth. You are present tense, the kingdom of God. You're my ambassador. And Jesus goes out of the temptation and he gets to the synagogue. Isn't it amazing? The first devil Jesus cast out was in church. And he gets to the synagogue, and they said, man, he's reading as one with authority, not as the scribes. See, a lot of people want a synagogue, but they don't want a temple. Synagogues where you just come together and talk about him. A bunch of scribes and people getting together, lawyers and stuff, talking about what they think it might mean. But the temple... It's where the glory was and where something impacted people. Mm. And so he goes to casting out devils. Now, if you'll notice in that temptation, the Satan said to him, all this has been transferred to me and I can give it to whoever I want to give it to. 
There's not a devil cast out in the Old Testament. But the moment Jesus walks into the synagogue, he start, Brother Howard starts casting out devils. You know why? Because as long as he's the kingdom of God on the earth, in that kingdom, Satan has absolutely no jurisdiction, no authority. That's why Jesus said, wherever the kingdom is, watch for this. You ready for it? First of all, there'll be glory and power. And the other thing you'll watch for is cast out devils, heal the sick, and raise the dead. Because it has no authority here. Ooh. See, that's why the devil wants to get you disaligned with God and his throne. I'm quiet. That's why he wants to get you there. Because as long as you stay submitted... As long as you have the exousia, you can operate in the dunamis. We got a lot of people like the sons of Sceva. It's their kingdom. They're trying to operate in the power of their kingdom. The guy says, no. Paul, we know Jesus. Why did he say that? Because Paul taught you in Corinthians, the head of the man is Christ. And what those demons were recognizing was the headship of Paul. He submitted to Christ. See, some of you want to cast out devils, but you better check your submission department first. Because the Bible says, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Now, if the devil you're rebuking, he's still sticking his tongue out at you. There's nothing wrong with the authority department. You need to check the submission department. All right, I'm closing. closing. So it's in this alignment. All of a sudden, the kingdom of God comes. And this is what we need in the end time. How are we going to combat what we're up against right now without the authority and the glory of God's kingdom? So I was trying to figure this out today. I said, God, I, 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 but where does this thing end tonight? Where does it end? Oh, that's easy. If they will just behold my glory. See, the veil is unbelief. See, because you don't believe, your unbelief has to create something as an illusion. It's our unbelief. But I read this. But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. He said, if my people tonight will behold my glory and you'll remove the veils of your unbelief, that's why we create veils. We really don't believe. We really don't believe. I was reading an article the other day from some religious men. They were talking about how to deal with cultures and stuff and America and it becoming all this relevant stuff and all. And this young man said, you let me tell you what's missing. He said, the gospel. He said, it doesn't matter what culture you're in. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. I'm going to tell you. So we, we've got to figure something out here. That Well, let me just stop. What are the needs what are the needs in this place tonight? I can't even begin to list them. But if we behold the glory, if we behold the glory, the glory has the ability to supply all of your need. You just need to get rid of your unbelief. Now I know we quote the verse of scripture about devils, this kind cometh not out but prayer and fasting. Well, the fact is Jesus has moved from the subject of casting out devils to addressing the disciples' unbelief. It was not that devils come out by prayer and fasting. He's saying your unbelief comes out by prayer and fasting. The devils are subject to my authority. You got a veil of unbelief over your heart. Miracles have been in this building all week. The supernatural has stared us in the face all week. 
Some of you just need to rip the veil of your unbelief off your heart and see the glory. And brother, when you see the glory, that's where God's... Sup- let me tell you, let me, let me tell you something. It's his, the glory is the intrinsic wealth of a man or whatever. So here's the deal. When he adorns all this stuff, he said in there. Now, just, just believe whatever you want to believe. I know the economy. I read the paper today. I know what the stock market's doing, all that stuff and all. But see, he didn't say, I'll supply your needs according to Dow Jones or the stock market. I'll supply your need according to my riches in glory. Now, some of you tie your faith to the economy. And when it's down, your faith is down. And when it's up, your faith is up. I got news for you. It doesn't matter who's voting in this president. Your needs being supplied is not tied to a politician. It's not tied to the wealth of the world. He said, it's tied to my glory. And when you behold my glory and you see my wealth, let me tell you something, folks. Some of you don't believe this. If God was to run out of money, all he'd have to do is just start saying, let there be gold bricks. And brother, you better go get a strong umbrella. Because it's going to start raining gold bricks. In the end time, if you don't learn to see the glory and the veil of fear and unbelief grips your heart, it's going to be a bad journey for you. But I got news for you. God never intended for us to go out broke or poor or anemic. He said, I'm going to clothe this end time church with my glory. You believe however you believe we're going out. I don't believe that. I don't believe we're going out whimpering. I don't believe we're going out just barely hanging on. I believe tonight some of you are going to see the glory. The glory that Calvary provided. And you're going to say, hey, now that I behold the glory, my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. Some of you don't even know it, but tonight God's going to put a glory of an apostolic ministry on you. He's going to put the glory of his provision on you. Are you listening to me? Some of you are going to stare at his glory tonight. Guess what's going to happen? Virtue is going to flow from the glory. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, the pain that's in your body is going to completely disappear. My God, we got enough cancer running through us. I understand all that stuff and God's sovereignty and all that, but I'm just going to tell you, somebody needs to see the glory tonight. And God's asking some of you, you need to get rid of that veil of your flesh. And you need to quit covering all this up. You need to rip it off and stare full in the face of Jesus Christ and realize everything that he has provided. There's miraculous provisions in this building right now. I said there's miraculous provisions in this building right now. It has been building all week to this moment. I don't want you just to see the glory. I want to envelop you with my glory. I want you to go home wrapped in my glory. When you get back, they're going to say, something's different. Something happened to you. What in the world? I I beheld the glory. It started with repentance. It started with me back at the brazen altar. But before Thursday night ended, I was standing in the Holy of Holies where the glory of God come descending. And when I beheld the glory and seen the fullness of his majesty, something happened to me. I'm telling you right now, you will be healed. 
Well, how can you say that? Because it's about his glory. You will be delivered. It's not about the glory of a man. It's not about who's holding the microphone. It's about the glory of God. It's about you seeing. Rip that veil off tonight. Say, I've veiled it long enough. I've struggled with it long enough. Let me tell you where some of you are at. Let me tell you where some of you are at. Oh, you tried it. Boy, I feel, can I just, I feel a little something here. Oh, well, I tried that apostolic ministry stuff, and I prayed and I fasted, and I stepped out, and nothing happened. Well, big deal. So now you got your veil. You got unbelief. You can't see what God's trying to provide for you because you've got some story about you stepped out on faith and nothing happened. My God, if I quit every time I stepped out on faith and nothing happened, I'd have been quitting 100,000 times. I'm just going to keep coming back. I'm not talking about goofy. I'm just going to keep coming back. And I'm going to look for the glory. Hey, I can have that. I can you be used like that. That can come on me. My God, we talked about mantles. It's the glory of yesterday. Folks, it's staring you in the face right now. Rip the veil off. Rip the veil off. Stand full in his face. See the glory of God and let him envelop you with that glory. He's calling some of you to the Mount of Transfiguration right now to stand and see the glory of God. Come on. Come on. Come on. The glory. It's getting ready to happen, the glory. The glory of the Lord is going to rise in this place. Go on. Go on. The glory of the Lord is going to rise in this place. The veil's got to come off. The fig leaves have to go. My disobedience has cost me enough. I want my heart to be obedient to the will of God, to the plan of God. Come on, just a few more seconds. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. It's waiting on you right now. Jesus has taken Peter, James, and John saying, come on with me to the top of the mountain tonight. I'm about to show you something the others won't see. Oh, it's not for all 12. It's not going to be for all 12. I'm calling Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain. I want to see you. Me. I want you to see me transfigured. I want you to see my glory. Come on, Peter. Come on, James. Come on, John. He's waiting for you on the top of the mountain. Something's about to be manifest. Something's about to show. We're getting ready to move into the end time drama. Come on, it's getting ready to fall. It's getting ready to manifest. You're climbing up the mountain with him. Somebody said, my, my side's starting to hurt. Is this going to be worth the journey tonight? Oh, trust me. It's going to be worth the journey. Just keep climbing. Keep on climbing. He's going to take you to the top of the mountain. There is a beckoning call to the Mount of Transfiguration tonight. I want you to see my glory so you'll know what you have. It's not going to be complicated, and it's not going to be hard. But if you want it, throw your hands in the air and cry out right now and let the glory do its work.
I want you to come to the top of the mountain so I can show you your future. I want to show you the glory that's intended for you. Not just me, but for the glory that's intended for you. Don't settle for the glory of man. I want to adorn you with my riches. I want to adorn you with my glory. Don't settle for the glory of the kingdoms of the world. You'll just keep crying out. Some of you about to enter a place of the Spirit. I don't think you've ever been. If you'll keep crying out right now, show me your glory. Take me to the mountain. Show me your glory. Show me your manifested glory. I'm telling you, when you behold the glory, your life will change. Your ministry will change. Your family will change. It's all about the glory. I said, come on, people, I don't want to touch this right now. The glory of the Lord is falling in here. This is the conclusion of a cause of the time, but God wants to show us his glory right here.
pray for me. A certain person would just come give me a word. But really what he does for tonight is for you to quit looking at the glory of man. And if you'll just look at him and see his glory, you will instantly be healed. You will be delivered. If you'll just get behind the veil, stand there until the glory manifests itself and you see him, your miracle will happen. It's in this building right now. It's flowing through these pews right now. Look full into his face. Your miracle's standing next to you right now. Your miracle is right there. The word you need is going to come right now. Ooh. Some of you come saying, I need a word. If so-and-so just come give me a word. Tonight the Holy Ghost is standing there right now in its glory. And he wants to speak directly. Come on, seek the glory. See him. See him. See him high and lifted up. Let his glory fill the temple. Woo! Your word's coming right now. The direction you need is coming right now. Mm. The thing that you so desperately needed is found in the riches of his glory.